Welcome to the Refuge Sermon of the Week. To listen to any of our other messages, or to get involved, head over to therefuge.online. We hope you enjoy this message by Pastor Jerry Alston. Well, we're going to continue our um, series on the fear of the Lord. We, we've got a lot to talk about, church. <laughs> um, this is the first time I've taught in my entire um, lifetime on the fear of the Lord, primarily because... Um, most of the messages I've heard on it, books I've read about it, kind of um, reduce it down to um, simply respect. And it is that, but I've always known in my heart that it's much more than that, but I wasn't sure what it was beyond that. And so I didn't really feel like I was at a place where I was ready to um, teach it. Um, I am now. I feel like the Lord's released me to do it, and um, I'm learning so much. There's over well over 200 scriptures in your Bible that reference the fear of the Lord, 40 alone in the New Testament. It is throughout your Bible. It's a fascinating, fascinating topic with, um, with so much potential. Um, I will say this, it's, it's big on my heart that through this series that um, it's not about shame or condemnation or guilt. We don't do that at the refuge. I don't believe God's into that. We're not into that. I don't believe it's helpful, so that's not what we're here to do. Um, it's not about a turn or burn kind of message, like, you know, get right or get left kind of thing. Um, it's not about an angry God who's mad at everybody and just looking for an opportunity to punish sinners. Um, uh, we believe at the refuge that love is the loudest thing in the room. The Bible says that it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance, and we celebrate that here. Uh, we believe that everybody's welcome to come as they are and that this is a safe place for people to come wherever they're at in life. But we also say this isn't a safe place to stay where you are. And so well, I'm not too concerned at where people are in their sp spiritual journey. I am very concerned about which direction they're going. And uh, so as long as we're all heading more and more towards Christ, then that's all we can ask for, and that's the goal. So um, keep that in mind as we, as we teach on this, but uh, it is a very serious subject, um, but I'm seeing so much beauty and so much joy and so much glory in this that um, it, it's really, I'm, I'm, I'm beyond excited. I'm perhaps... This is possibly the most excited I've been about a series I've ever taught, maybe with the exception of the series that I did on living free. Um, and that one I'm supposed to write a book on and pray that someday I'm actually disciplined enough to do it. Um, but uh, but this, one, this one is big as well. And so with that, if you missed last Sunday, I'd really like you to go back and listen at your leisure to last Sunday's message. These are going to build on each other. This is a new topic for us because, again, I've never taught on it. Um, so this is new content for a lot of us. So make sure you're going back. If you, We know that you can't be here every Sunday, but if you miss a Sunday, make sure and go back and catch it and listen to it. And I would probably recommend some of these listening to more than once because we're kind of, we're kind of planting that seed and getting some ideas in us that... Um, they're just not taught a lot. Um, you know, the fear of the Lord isn't a real common subject that's taught on, and it's unfortunate because it's, it's such a beautiful topic. So um, with that, let me go ahead and pray, and then we'll um, enter into today's uh, teaching. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for um, who you are. Lord, I pray that um, a spirit of the fear of the Lord would fall on this place and that we would stand really in awe of you and wonder at who you are, that we would get a glimpse of just how big and amazing you truly are. Uh, lead and guide us now as we, as we dive into this teaching. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, this is the fear of the Lord part two. Um, as I said, I've, I've heard it said that the fear of the Lord is, is respect and reverence. And it is that, but it is, it is much, much more. And so as I've been studying um, the scriptures and the word on the fear of the Lord, I'm trying to come up with a definition for what I think it means. And the best definition I have at this time for the fear of the Lord is that it's an invitation to know him at a greater level. The fear of the Lord is an invitation to know him at a greater level, to get a greater glimpse of his glory. 
Now, as I've learned, as I've been studying, nobody can see the full glory of God and survive it. But the more the fear of the Lord increases, the more of the glory of God we get to see. It's throughout Scripture over and over and over again. The fear of the Lord is linked to being able to experience more of who God is. So this is why I say it's such a beautiful topic because it's, it's not a, hey, you better get your act together or something bad's going to happen to you. It's a, hey, if you learn what the fear of the Lord is, you can know him at a much higher level than, uh, than perhaps we currently do. Amen? Um, Exodus 20.20 20 says this, uh, do, not fear, do not fear, for God has come to test you that his fear may be before you. And I love that because the fear of the Lord is not being afraid of God. And, and here's a great example of it. Do not Fear, for God has come to test you to see if the fear of the Lord is in you. And in Exodus 20 here, this whole event that's going on, this is Moses um, going up to Mount Sinai. It's when he got the Ten Commandments. He actually took about nine trips up and down the mountain throughout that process. Uh, eight, I think. Eight or nine, I think. Um, and uh, so uh, when he was invited to go up, the children of Israel were invited to come to the base of the mountain. And God said, I'm going to come down and I'm going to talk to all of my kids. I'm going to talk to all of my kids. And then the, the, the children of Israel got scared because the mountain started to smoke and the mountain started to shake. And so they began to realize just how big and awesome God was. Like, wait a minute, this isn't, this isn't my, like my little buddy that, that we just like hang out all day. This is God Almighty, right? And, and the mountain starts to shake and the mountain starts to smoke and they get scared and they run away from God. And Moses comes to them and says, don't be afraid. God's come to test you to see if the fear of the Lord is in you. The fear of the Lord will draw you to God, not away from God. Being afraid of God will draw you away. But the fear of the Lord will actually cause you to draw near to him in ways that perhaps you never have. Proverbs 9.10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Think about that for a minute. Did this go off? We still on? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The fear of the Lord is the foundation for the knowledge of who God really is. If, you want, if we want to really know who God is, the fear of the Lord is the starting point. It's the foundation. And if you build your foundation absent from, if you build your foundation on the knowledge of God, absent from the fear of God, it will be a weak foundation. And when trials and come and they come, your faith in God will be shaken because your knowledge of him was not built on the sure foundation, which is the fear of the Lord. Do you see how important this becomes? Isaiah 33 and verse 6 out of the NIV translation he will be a sure foundation for your times. How many of you have experienced times in your life when it's critical that you have a sure foundation? When everything's going great and everything's rosy, the foundation can be weak and maybe nobody notices. But we all find times in our life that's going to, thank you, we all find times in our life when our foundation will be tested. He will be a sure foundation for your times, a rich storehouse of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. The, watch this. The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. The fear of the Lord is key to having a sure foundation, a rich storehouse of salvation. The fear of the Lord is the key. They did a study recently, and, and this just breaks my heart, um, that says it's estimated that 1.2 million people leave church every year right now. 
Think about that for a minute. 1.2 million people every year leave the church right now. And um, we see ministers dropping out of the ministry. There's a shortage of ministers. We see churches closing down because they can't find pastors to pastor the churches. And I believe one of the key reasons why this is happening is because of a, a lack of the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is, is this invitation to really know him. We, we talk so much here at the refuge about, about the presence of God and the reason we invest so much in our, in our worship time of service to give you guys the opportunity to experience his presence is because I believe that it's, it's when we know him, it's one thing to know about him, but when you know him, then when the trials come, then when the storms come, we're built on a sure foundation. And you can't know him without a fear of him. See, if we rely on, on something else other than that sure foundation of who God is, when those trials come, we'll be shaken. Psalm 38, uh, I'm sorry, Psalm 34, 8 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see. Don't, don't hear about the goodness. Of, it's, it's, hey, I'm, I'm glad you're hearing about the goodness of God, and, and we should be hearing about the goodness of God, but we need you to taste and see that the Lord is good. And that comes through the fear of God. We, we, we said this last week, and in Exodus is where this story plays out when Moses was going to Mount Sinai, that um, without, in the absence of the fear of the Lord, we really, in my opinion, only have three options. One, we can choose to not believe in God, and if we don't believe in him, then there's no need to fear him. Um, two, we can, this is what the children of Israel did, we can have somebody else draw near to God for us and then come tell us what God said. And this is what, this is exactly what the children of Israel said. Moses, God's too scary for us. Like we saw the mountain shake, we saw the smoke. Nope, we're not approaching that. So Moses, you go talk to God for us and tell us what to do. And whatever you say to do, Moses, we'll do it. Right? The problem is if, you're in, if your experience and your knowledge of God is only based on what your pastor has told you, if your worship experience is only what you've watched the worship team do and you've never tasted and seen that the Lord is good for yourself, you, are not, you do not have a firm foundation and it will not stand. And so, and so this sounds good. Moses is going to hear it from God for us. He's going to tell us what to do and we'll obey except for what happened. Moses was gone for 40 days up there, and they decided, you know what? Let's just make us a God that suits our needs. And they ask Aaron to do it for them, and so then they, they make the golden calf, remember? <laughs> Aaron gets everybody's gold and, and, and their jewelry, and, and he puts it in the fire, and they make this calf, this God that they can worship, and they say, we will follow this God. They actually call the calf Elohim. Fascinating, which is the name used for God all throughout Genesis and all throughout the scripture. It's also used for false gods a few times. But then Moses, or then Aaron turns around and says, tomorrow he builds a tabernacle to this golden calf and says, tomorrow we'll have a feast to the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, that is Yahweh. That is the most holy name for God. For Aaron to call a golden calf Yahweh, wow. How did, how did, how did it happen? They didn't encounter God for themselves. They were relying on somebody else to hear from God for them. And then when their faith got, got rocked, when they began to doubt, when 40 days went by or, or, or 140 days or 360 days of trial or a season of trials goes by and your faith begins to get tested and tried and shaken, you need to have had an encounter with God Almighty yourself because that will stand. I, you won't, listen, when you're in the middle of a serious trial, what Pastor Jerry said is not going to help you. Your encounter with God Almighty is what's going to help you.
The other thing, the, this danger, if, if we don't fear God, and so then we, we make our own golden calves, and I know I've, I've been guilty of doing this, right? Like, like, let's make a God that suits my taste, the, the, a God that serves me, a God that gives me what I want and that likes what I like and doesn't like what I don't like. And we live in a culture that is rampant with that, and there are churches out there that are rampant with that spirit right now. Let's just accept this because this is what the people like. And so we're going to have a God that likes this. And there's a complete absence of the fear of God. Hey, if we like it, culture likes it, let's go ahead. Let's put the calf back in the fire and let's reform him into something else that suits current modern culture. And let's worship that God. Again, the problem is when the trials of life come, You don't have a sure foundation to stand on because you've never encountered the true and living God who very clearly loves certain things and hates certain things. And part of the fear of the Lord is to love what he loves and hate what he hates. In this series, at some point in time, hopefully we'll teach on how to hate what God hates without using hate to hate hate. (laughs) Come on now, let that rattle around. That's pretty deep, actually. (laughs) Because that's where the church gets goofy with this kind of stuff, is they start using hate to, to hate what God hates, and we're supposed to use love. That's about three, four weeks down the road. Buckle up, it's going to be a good summertime at the refuge. As somebody, somebody brought to my attention, every summer at the refuge, we get into the heavy stuff. And it's never intentional. I never planned it. And I'd actually forgotten all about it. We closed last Sunday's service. And Jeff stands up and goes, it's summertime at the refuge. <laughs> Buckle up, buttercup. It's going to get real. <laughs> all right. I want to talk to you today about uh, three, three keys to cultivating the fear of the Lord. Let's, let's give you some stuff that you, can, that you can do and that you can put to work to cultivate this spirit of the fear of the Lord. Number one, repentance. Repentance. Now remember that repentance is not um, groveling in the mud and talking about what a loser you are and how sorry you are for being such a low life. Repentance is actually changing your mind. It's thinking differently than you used to think. Amen? That's what repentance is. In uh, Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, it says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who spoke of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, notice this phrase, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the Baptist's ministry was to prepare the people to receive the presence of God, to receive the kingdom of God. And the first thing that was required to get ready was repentance. Luke 1 and verse 7, this is a, a similar scriptural. This is actually when the angel is, is talking to Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, before John the Baptist was um, um, born. And he's telling Zacharias that John the Baptist, he will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord to make red. Remember the fear of the Lord is an invitation to the presence of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is an invitation to know him in a greater way. John came, John the Baptist came to prepare the people for the presence of the Lord. And his message was a message of repentance, which means to change the way you think. An unwillingness to change the way we think is perhaps the greatest hindrance to having the spirit of the fear of the Lord in you. You, We have to be willing to be wrong. We have to be willing to be corrected. This series is very much birthed out of three spiritual warning dreams that I received from the Lord in the series of about 60 days. And they were intense. 
And I realize that there's some change that, that I need to make. I need to repent. I need to, I need to change. And we have to be willing to be corrected. We have to be willing to admit that, hey, I was thinking about this the wrong way. More than just be, being willing to change, we actually should in, be encouraged continually to seek the Lord. Where would he have us to change? Like make that part of our daily rhythms. God, search my heart. And, and see if there's any wicked thing in me. Teach me your statutes, O Lord. The 119th Psalm is like filled with this. Teach me your ways, God, that I might walk in them. Show me your paths. Teach me your paths. That should be part of our daily rhythms and our daily lives continually throughout the day. God, show me your ways. Search my heart to see if there's any wicked way in me. So that I can change, so that I can repent, so that I can please you, so that I can walk in the fear of the Lord, so that I can see and encounter you, so that when trials come, I'm on a sure foundation. I want to read, um, I want to read Psalm 139, 23 through 24, and I'm going to read it out of the Passion Translation. And we'll put it up on the screen here. And I just love this. God, I invite your searching gaze into my heart. <laughs> Boy, if we just did that. God, I invite. <laughs> what if instead of hiding things, we invited God, his searching gaze into our heart? I think, you know, we all know that nothing is hidden before the Lord, but I know I've been pretty good at pretending like it is sometimes. Like, oh, he doesn't see this part. What if part of my daily rhythm and my daily routine continually throughout the day was, God, I invite your searching gaze into my heart. Examine me through and through. Find out everything that may be hidden within me. It's a good, good first step to the fear of the Lord. Put me to the test and sift through all my anxious cares. Oh, dear Lord. I mean, just reading this instills the fear of the Lord in me. See if there's any path, I love this, see if there's any path of pain I am walking on. The New King James and many other translations here say, um, see if there is any wicked thing in me. And I, but I love this. See if there's any path of pain I am walking on. And lead me back to your glorious, everlasting way, the path that brings me back to you. The fear of the Lord is an invitation to know him in a deeper and deeper manner. Psalm 86, 11. The psalmist says, Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Huh. Interesting statement. Unite my heart to fear your name. Teach me your path. Teach me your ways so that I can walk in. The only way I can please God, the only way I can, I can walk in God's ways is if he teaches me his ways. That I might walk in them. And then he says, unite my heart to fear your name. Let's make repentance part of our culture, part of our DNA, part of who we are, that we're just daily saying, God, God, search my heart. Man, I've been doing this for a couple of weeks now and um, just, just really, really intentional. I mean, it's not like I first started doing it two weeks ago, but, but, but very intentionally for the last couple of weeks, I've been doing this. Um, and, and I'm shocked at how many just random thoughts I'll have that the Holy Spirit will check me on and say, wait a minute, that's, that's a wicked, evil, vile thought. And it could be a thought about self-promotion, about making a phone call to somebody at work, at my job, that's going to make me look good, and my motives are a little twisted on it. I mean, it can be the simplest little thing. But when, when I'm attuned to this, when I, when I have the fear of the Lord in me, and I'm like, God, search at my heart, see if there's any wicked thing in me, any path of pain that I'm walking on, man, it's like, 
boom, oh, that one, that one, that one. And I'm like, okay, repent, 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 repent. And it's just changing my mind. It's just changing the way I'm thinking. It's the, it's the most glorious thing in the world to do. And it's, and it's fun because the, the writer of Hebrews says that when we're corrected by the Lord, it's how we know that he loves us. And, and I'm telling you, this, a lot of this started for me, um, maybe a few months back, I started praying this prayer for the first time in my life this way. God, don't spare the rod of correction on my life. And I began to pray that. And then pretty soon, here comes correction. Three spiritual warning dreams, more stuff coming, and I'm being corrected. And, and I don't, there's no guilt, there's no shame, there's no condemnation, there's no sadness. It's all glorious because, man, do I feel loved right now. I mean, I feel so loved because I've got the Father's attention. Because remember, we said last week, the eye of the Lord is towards those who fear him. Hmm. It's so much fun. <laughs> number two, reverence. Reverence. Number one, repentance. Number two, reverence. Psalm 5, 7. In fear of you, I will worship you. But as for me, I will come into your house in the multitude of your mercy. In fear of you. I will worship towards your holy temple. Reverence is, um, is something that is sadly, sadly lacking in our culture today and in, the, in, in our generation. Uh, we don't see it in, in many households. We don't see it in the workplace. Um, we don't see it in very many churches. It's just something that has really been lost in, in our current culture. And we really need to bring it back. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm thankful that... Um, you know, that, that, that we can dress casual. I'm thankful that I can wear jeans and I, and, and I don't have to put on a tie every Sunday morning. But back in the day, we reverenced the house of God to the point that, that you wouldn't show up without a tie on. And, 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 and it was just a different culture. And with all of this stuff, there's ditches on both sides. And I think we were very much on a ditch of legalism for a long time that, do, that does produce guilt and shame and does uh, take people away from God. And then we kind of hit the middle of the road for a little bit and then we kept going. And now I believe we are firmly planted in the ditch of just grace covers everything and, and we can just, you know, come to God however we want and all is good because after all, he's my buddy and my friend. And, and I think, I think we, need to, we need to kind of get out of that ditch and hopefully firmly get planted in the middle of the road without ending up over there in that other ditch. In fear, I will worship you. Irreverence in God's presence is dangerous. Remember, I said this, that I believe the fear of the Lord is an invitation to know God in a greater way, to see more of his glory. And you see this so clearly in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Look at Leviticus 26. Leviticus 26, verses 1 and 2. It says, You shall not make idols for yourselves, neither a carved image nor a sacred pillar shall you rear up for yourself, nor shall you set up an engraved stone in your land to bow down to it, for I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord, capital L-O-R-D. Anytime you see that all capitalized, take it really serious. That's Yahweh. That's the word that is so holy, the Jews reverence that name so much they won't even say it out loud. You will reverence my sanctuary, my presence. Levit let's look at Levit Leviticus 10, 1 through 3, and let's look at what happens when you don't do that. At, at this time... There are six people on planet Earth that can come into the presence of God. All of mankind, the entire planet, only six people can come into the presence of God. Moses, Aaron, and Aaron's four sons. That's it. Anybody else comes into the presence of God, they die. Because that's how big God is. That's how glorious he is. That's how perfect he is. All right? 
Remember, the fear of the Lord is an invitation into his presence. So in Leviticus 10, verses 1 through 3, Then Nadab and Abihu, those are two of Aaron's sons. Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. That word profane is the word irreverent. That's all it means. Irreverent. Profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Two of Aaron's kids die in the presence of God because of irreverence. And, this, and then Moses says to Aaron, this is what the Lord said to me. By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. How astounding is that? You lose two of your kids to the presence of God. God says, it's because I wasn't reverenced. What happened, I believe, with, with Nadab and Abihu is they got familiar with the presence of God. I believe, I know there was a time when they would come before the presence of the Lord with fear and trembling, with awe and wonder. And then after a while, they just did it, and they just did it, and they just did it. And pretty soon, it's, oh, the presence of God again. Oh, the glory of God again. Yeah, whatever, we've done this a hundred times. And they entered in with irreverence. And I think of, do we do that? When we, when we worship God and we, and we say, oh, another great worship set. And the worship team knocked it out of the park today. They nailed it. Great job. We're so blessed to have such great worship. Are we in danger of getting so familiar with it and so accustomed to it that we lose the awe and wonder of it all, the reverence of it all, of who God really is? And you say, yeah, well, you know, that's the Old Testament. We're under the new covenant. And, you know, now it's all good because we're washed with the blood of Jesus. We're forgiven. Yes, you are. But let's look at Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. So the New Testament church, Jesus is resurrected. We've been forgiven. We've been washed with the blood of Jesus. We're robed in righteousness. We're new creatures in Christ Jesus. All is well. And in the book of Acts, the glory of God is manifesting in that church at the level that we all, that most of us dream of. I cannot tell you how many times I have, without really thinking about what I'm saying, said, I want a book of Acts church. I, and I do. I want a book of Acts church. Because in the book of Acts, listen, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost fell. 5,000 people gave their lives to Jesus that day. The church grew and multiplied. The church had such glory. They walked in such presence of God. They had such glory that, that the spirit of generosity broke out throughout the whole church. They all started giving away their stuff, sharing. All of a sudden, the, the needy are taken care of. The, listen, the, the, we have a book of Acts church. The homeless problem in, in Benton County will be solved. Because we'll, all, we'll all start selling our stuff and start taking care of them. We'll, or better yet, we'll all start inviting them to come live in our homes one at a time. You know there's way more Christians in Benton County than there are homeless people? If every Christian invited one homeless person to come live in their home, the problem would be solved. Just saying. <laughs> The power of God, the power of God was, was moving so big in the power of Acts. The glory of God, the presence of God was so present. Remember, the fear of the Lord is an invitation into his presence. The presence of the Lord was, was so, the glory of God was so magnific magnificent in the book of Acts church that, that they would take sick people and line them up in the streets while Peter walked down the street lest his shadow would fall on them and heal some of them. Imagine if the glory of God was so in manifestation that they just took all the sick people lest Eddie walk down the street one, one Saturday afternoon and maybe a shadow would fall on them and they'd be healed. This was how, how tremendous the presence and the glory of God was. 
And so I said, they're all being generous. They're, they're giving their stuff away. And so this one dude, he sells a piece of land and he brings the money and he, and he you talk about awkward. <laughs> I think it's awkward to pass plates for an offering. Right? That's why we have the bucket out there, or the thing out there. We don't talk about it. We just trust you to do it. <laughs> Gee, Jesus. Can I talk about this for a minute? It's completely off script. Jesus is in, a, is, is in a synagogue and they're taking up an offering and he's standing there literally counting the money as they put it in. <laughs> oh, Gary and Julie put in 25000 <laughs> Patty put in 150000 Oh, Kenan put in 10 cents and Kenan put in more than everybody else did because he gave all that he had. He like, he like publicly counted the offering as they were bringing it in. How awkward would that be? And, and, and told everybody what was, what was happening, right? Fascinating. So this is going on here in the book of Acts now. We're having a similar thing, like, like the glory of God, the power of God, the presence of God is so thick. It's moving so much. The fear of God is so in that place that people are just doing the crazy things. They're not singing about laying down their lives. They're laying down their lives. They're not singing Jesus have it all. They're giving Jesus all. Come on, somebody. It's one thing to sing Jesus have it all. It's another thing to give it all to him. And they're giving it all. And so this man sells a piece of land and he comes and he gives all of the money. He lays it at the apostles' feet. It get awkward, right? I don't ever want to do that at the refuge. I don't, just put it in the box out there. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then this couple, Ananias and Sapphira, they sell a piece of land. My theory is, is that they were the biggest givers in the church and they didn't want to be outdone by this other guy that gave big. That's just my own theory. I'm just making that up. I have no idea if that's true or not. So they go and they sell a piece of land, but it's a very valuable piece of land. And so they don't want to give it all, but they don't want to appear like they're keeping some back from themselves. And so they give a portion of it. And they drop dead. <laughs> Ananias drops dead. Sapphira comes in trying to find out where her husband's at, probably looking for an attaboy for the big gift that they just gave. And the apostles say, hey, uh, is this the sum that you sold your land for? And she says, yeah, yeah, that's it. And then he says, how is it that you lied to the Holy Spirit? Look, the feet of those who drug your husband are still at the door, and, and now they're going to drag you out too. And they're like buried six feet under in the field behind the church. And they just keep taking up the offering. Church doesn't stop. Made me really think about the next time I say I want a book of Acts church. <laughs> and I do. But do you see how we have to be prepared for the glory of God? We have to be prepared for his presence. I want his glory. I want his presence. But throughout scripture, and we could do this all day long, New Testament and Old Testament, of people who encountered his glory with irreverence and the swift judgment that fell. Judgment happens in the New Testament. Ananias and Sapphira were judged, and they were dead. That would be an awkward offering. Ah, two more drop dead. We'd have to have like a special usher team just to drag the bodies out. <laughs> Anthony, you want to sign up for that? <laughs> have to rent a backhoe or buy a backhoe so we could. <laughs> huh. and, and here's what I want you to know in this. Sin is not the problem. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Jesus took care of sin. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, Jesus took care of the sin problem. This is, this is what you need. We need to balance this now a little bit, okay? Let's, let's come back to, to reality. Jesus took care of sin. All right. You are robed in righteousness. You are clean because of the blood of Jesus. There is nothing you can do to earn God's favor. You are, it's only by the blood. All right. We are talking about irreverence. Okay. 
And we're not talking about sin, we're talking about irreverence, which is a type of sin, but it's, it's unique. We're talking about not reverencing the presence of God. And I, and I just think we've got a lot to learn in how to do that. Like, what's, I, I, I don't think I have to put on a suit and tie to reverence God. But I do think there are some things I do need to do to reverence God. And I think in this journey, we'll learn how do we do that and what's an appropriate way to show God reverence in his house. You, you see this throughout. The, 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 more, the more glory, the more presence, the more power the more reverence is required. Let me say that again. We, we long for the glory of God. We long for the power of God in our churches. We long to have power. We want to have, the Bible says in the book of Acts that when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, we'll have power to be witnesses. Don't we all just long that we could witness to our unsaved friends and that there'd be power behind it? That it wouldn't be just words, that it wouldn't fall on deaf ears, but that there'd actually be power behind it. Throughout scripture, you see this. The more power, the more glory, the more presence, the more reverence is required. Reverence must increase with presence. I will say this. I 100% believe that God withholds his presence and his glory from us out of mercy. So that we don't have to have a special usher team to haul the bodies out. <laughs> is this making sense? There's a scripture uh, in, in, the, in, in the New Testament that, that talks about that because you, because you saw God and you knew God and it didn't create any change in you, you're guilty. You would have actually been better off if you never would have heard the truth in the first place. And I think sometimes God withholds his glory. He withholds his presence or he only gives us little glimpses of it. And you see this. Moses was able to go up and stand before almost the full glory of God. But you see the result when people ex see the glory of God and they don't reverence it. And then the third and the final um, key to, I believe, fostering the fear of the Lord in us is obedience. Obedience. So repentance, reverence, and then obedience. Isaiah 119 says that if you're willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the Lord. Obedience is another virtue that is lacking in our culture. It's almost a word that is... That is um, you know, when people hear it, they, they, they pull back and withdraw from, oh, he's talking about obedience. I'm, I don't want to hear that word, right? Because, because you know, we're under, the, we're under the age of grace. Here's, here's something to remember. When you, when you read the Old, Old Testament, like, like read Leviticus. It's a fascinating read. <laughs> um, we serve the same God. God didn't change, Right? And here's something that's, that's crazy fascinating to me is that we can say, well, that's the law, that's the law, that's the law. And, but Jesus said, surely I say unto you that, that not one jot or one tittle will pass away until all of the law has been fulfilled. Don't think that I've come to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill it. And then he goes on to say that the requirement of grace is actually stricter than the law. We think we get a break because we're under grace. <laughs> it's not the way it works. The, the, the requirement under grace is stricter than the law. The law says don't murder anyone. I don't know that I've ever been tempted to murder anybody. It's not a hard law for me to keep. Grace says if you call somebody an idiot, you're guilty. Hmm. I've done that one a few times. <laughs> I'm tempted to do that one daily. And grace says that I don't get to do that. The law says if you commit adultery, grace says if you even look at a woman with the wrong thought, you're guilty. The difference is, 
Under grace, we have divine help to fulfill it. Under the law, we were on our own and we couldn't do it. This is all, this is what Paul gets into when he gets really deep in Romans. This is what he's talking about, that, that, that under the law, the law was weak because it said this is who God is and this is how you have to live if you're going to be before him. But you have to do it in your own strength and ability. And we can't. Grace says, okay, let's ratchet it up a few notches and let's make the requirement even greater. But now let's give you divine help to do it. Because we, if we fear the Lord, the presence of God is manifest in us. Let me see if I can get there. The first tabernacle or dwelling place of God was the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve walked with God fully in his glory, fully in his presence. Adam and Eve were naked and unashamed. I can't prove this, but I think the reason they were naked and unashamed was because they were clothed in the very glory of God. Isn't it interesting that mankind is the only thing God created that he didn't give him clothes? Birds have feathers, bears have fur, all fish have scales. Man is naked because he was built to be clothed with the glory of God, the very presence of God. Adam and Eve sinned, glory of God departs, God kills a couple of animals, clothes Adam and Eve. Second tabernacle, second place that God comes to dwell in is the tabernacle that was built in the um, wilderness. Um, this was right after, the, right after Exodus, Mount Sinai, the, the Ten Commandments. Then they build this tabernacle. God gives great, great detail in how this house that God's going to move into is going to be. Great detail. It has to be just right, just in order. As soon as it's done, God moves in there. Gives six people permission to come and be with him. Second temple, there was, a, there was a second one. Then there was a third one, which was Solomon's temple. Again, great splendor, great detail. Um, a handful of people are ever, Book of Acts, God finally moves into the temple, he's, the house he's always wanted to live in. And that is you, my friend. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Finally, God gets to move into the home he's always longed to live in. And it's you, and it's me. And this is why under grace, the requirement is greater. And we've got him in us to do it. And we've got the blood of Jesus to forgive us when we miss it. And we do, all have sinned. So we're, we're forgiven. But let's raise the bar a little bit. Obedience. We, 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 we talk a lot about the joy and, and I celebrate the joy of the Lord is our strength. And that scripture actually on the joy of the Lord is our strength. It ha, it, it's, it's quoted after the people repented. <laughs> and, and the word of the Lord was spoken and they finally understand the word of the Lord. And, then, and they're actually weeping because they're going, oh my gosh, they're repenting. Like, oh my gosh, we, we missed it. And, and now we see and our eyes are opened. And, and then the word comes, hey, don't weep and mourn. The joy of the Lord is your strength. See, joy comes as a result of obedience. And if we try to, if we try to put on joy before being obedient, it, it's a fake joy. It's a, it's a, it's a put on, it's a, it's a show. It's a, and I've tried it like, you know, coming like, woo -hoo, woo -hoo, go Rudy. It's going to be awesome. Woo -hoo. It's going to be a good one. That's what the sign says. <laughs> but, but joy is a byproduct of obedience. Let me, let me, let me show this to you. Psalm 119 verse two. What joy overwhelms everyone who keeps the way of God those who seek him as their heart's passion. What joy overwhelms those who keep the way of God. Joy is a byproduct of obedience. John 15, 19, 9 through 14. We're almost done here. Y'all doing all right? Yeah. Summertime at the refuge.
Um, John 15, 9 through 14. Jesus speaking. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, if you're obedient, you will abide in my love. The fear of the Lord is an invitation to the presence of God. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken to you, watch this, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Whose joy is full? Those who keep his commandments. Whose joy is full? Those who keep his commandments. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. We may get into this in this series because we've reduced that down to um, way less than it is. Greater love is no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends. This shocked me. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. You are my friends if I do whatever I command you. I read that, and, I, and I've read it many, many times, but as I was, as I was preparing for this message and read it, um, I had this thought, you're my friend if you do whatever I command you. But wait a minute, Jesus, aren't you a friend to sinners? And so then I had this thought, well, maybe sinners, those who, by sinners, I mean those who haven't come to Christ. Again, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God, but as a follower of Jesus, your sins are forgiven. So if Jesus is a friend to sinners, but I'm your friend if you do whatever I command you, I had this thought, well, maybe there's two different standards. Maybe, maybe for those that haven't come to Christ yet, they live under a different standard than those who have. And that actually is true. And we'll talk about that at some point in time also when the church needs to know how, you know, this is a message for believers. This isn't a message to go share with your unsaved loved one necessarily, unless you're led to. So then I started doing a little research. And I found out, to my shock and awe, that Jesus never called himself a friend of sinners. Not once. The Bible does not say that Jesus is a friend of sinners. You know who called Jesus a friend of sinners? The Pharisees, at the same time, they called him a drunk and a glutton. <laughs> is this too much? <laughs> it freaked me out. I started calling my pastor friends going, man, what, what do I do with this? <laughs> Jesus loves sinners. Jesus died for sinners. Jesus gave all for sinners. Jesus dined with sinners, hung out with sinners. But he wasn't a friend to sinners. He's a friend to those who keep his commandments. Isn't that fascinating? Jesus tells me to love my enemies. He doesn't tell me to be a friend to my enemy. So then we got to understand or try to understand what does friend mean to Jesus? <laughs> Not there yet. <laughs> Stay tuned. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see if we can figure that one out. Because uh, what I do know is that I very much want to be called a friend of Jesus. And what I do also know is that if I look at that scripture, I don't know if I am yet. Maybe I am. I hope I am. But based on this, maybe there's some work to do. I want to be called. Moses was called a friend of God. With that, he had special. God talked to Moses like a friend. I'm going to wrap this up really quick with four points. I'm going to take five minutes on this. I, uh, by the way, last Sunday when I said, will you give me five minutes? And then I said, I'm just kidding, 10 minutes. Um, I looked on the podcast. It was actually 14 minutes. <laughs> so we'll see how this goes. 
I want to talk to you just, just real quick. I want to give you four keys for We see the importance of obedience. That's when joy comes. That's when God calls us a friend. I want to be called a friend of God. I want to have this conversation. I told you that I have this, this interesting prayer that I pray sometimes where I ask God, like, can we talk about something that has nothing to do with me or my ministry or my church or my life at all? Like, God, how did your day go? Right? Like, 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 like what, what made you happy today? What broke your heart today? That's completely out of my sphere. Can we, can we just talk about something other than me? And I've, and I've never had a breakthrough with that. And I wonder if it's because God doesn't yet talk to me like a friend. Because to me, that's a conversation you would have with a friend. Right? Like if I have friends here. If, if I ask, you know, if I ask my wife, you know, how'd your day go? She's going to tell me things that she wouldn't tell to a stranger. Because we're friends. I don't know. Just wondering. Four, four quick things on obedience. Number one, be quick to obey. My kids have heard me uh, say this throughout their childhood. Quick to obey, quick to obey. Uh, Psalm 119 and 60. I made haste and did, did not delay to keep your commandments. Don't you love that? I made haste and did not delay to keep your commandments. Be quick to obey. When God says to do something, do it quickly. Just as quickly as you can. Don't put it off. Don't delay. Be quick to obey, number one. Number two, obey when it doesn't make sense. Obey when it doesn't make sense. Proverbs 3, 5 says, don't lean to your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all of his ways and he'll direct your path. Listen to me, obedience will oftentimes not make sense. It didn't make sense for Jesus to spit in the ground and make a mud ball and stick it in a guy's eye socket. It doesn't make sense, but he did it and he got results because it was obedience. If we're going to fear God, we're going to have to be able to just obey whether it makes sense or doesn't make sense. Number three, obey when it costs you. Obey when it costs you. Philippians 2.8 says that Jesus was obedient even to the point of death. It's easy to be obedient when you think there's something. For, for me, it's easy to be obedient when I think there's something in it for me. But to be obedient when I know this is going to cost me, that's a whole different thing. Obey even when it costs you. And then fourthly, obey completely. Uh, I can be pretty sneaky about this, and I can like, I can like obey like 90%. And like, and like try to give myself, try to feel good about that. Saul tried that. Didn't work out so good for him. <laughs> the, the Lord told Saul to do something that, that, that was hard, that didn't make sense. It, it still doesn't make sense to me at all, exactly why God. But basically, he told him to annihilate a whole bunch of people and things. Um, and and it, it was extreme. What did he ask him to do? And, and he obeyed like 99% of the way he obeyed. But there was this one little part that he kept back that he just didn't do. And that was the downfall of Saul. From that moment on, God said, I regret that I ever made you king and I'm taking the kingdom away from you because you didn't obey fully. If we're going to have obedience in our life, let's be, let's be quick to obey. Let's obey when it doesn't make sense. Let's obey when it's hard and it costs us. And let's obey completely. How do you know if I obeyed completely? Search me, O oh Lord. Search my heart. Examine my heart. Look deep into my heart and see if I'm walking on any way. Is there anything that I'm withholding? Is there anything that you've asked me to do that I haven't done? Have I obeyed fully? Make that part of our daily rhythms, our daily routines of asking God, God to search our hearts and just feel how much he loves us. Again, all of this is an invitation to his presence. It's all an invitation to his joy and his glory. Joy comes in the morning. Morning represents when we open our eyes and see something clearly for the first time. Oh, I see. I repent. It's morning. Joy comes. Woo, glory to God. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen.
God has so much for us. I hope this blessed you. I hope it wasn't too heavy or hard for you. Um, and uh, as I said, if you missed last week, I encourage you to go back and listen to it. If you can't make it next week, uh, tune in and, and listen as we continue on this series. So let me pray. Father, we love you. We thank you so much. Um, what an awesome subject, Lord. Thanks for taking us through it. Um, correct anything that, that, that I say that isn't of you and, and make it right. And we only want truth. We only want to honor you. And, and so um, I just trust that you'll be with each one this week as we go and invite you to search our hearts and see if there's any wicked thing in us. Teach us your statutes, Father, that we might walk in them. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week. We hope you enjoyed that message by Pastor Jerry Alston. If you would like to partner with us or for more information, visit our website at therefuge.online.